da 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 when i popped off then you go gave me the rhetoric of the nra and wealth inequality how a libertarian ideology has infiltrated the republican party and produce an environment conducive to greater wealth inequality. Firearms, safety education, marksmanship training, shooting for recreation. How many people recognize this mission statement? This was the original mission of the NRA when it was formed in 1871. When we compare to the, the present organization to its past, it is barely recognizable. How did one of the biggest proponents of gun control and safety turn into the unapologetic defender of the Second Amendment? This question is important because the answer ties into the staggering wealth inequality experienced today. See, I theorize that the rise of wealth inequality is connected to this change in rhetoric of the NRA. By no means am I saying that the NRA is solely to blame, but they have had a noticeable impact on policy and voters. While many people have focused on what specific policies and aspects have led us towards today's wealth inequality, I offer the perspective of how voters have been led astray to vote against their own self-interest through the clever marketing and rhetorical tactics of one of the most influential special interest groups today. The NRA has had a complete change of philosophy that directly correlates to the timeline of increasing wealth inequality across the nation. As the NRA began to pursue and reshape the lens of public policy, its new extreme libertarian views closely aligned with the Republican Party and over time shifted the party more to the right. As this relationship began to grow and the NRA gained traction, wealth inequality also began to rise substantially. I begin where it all started by defining the NRA before the 1970s and how it transformed into the NRA we all know today. At the same time, I intend to show the rising wealth inequality that was happening in the background as the NRA began to redefine the role of the government through its rising membership, lobby money. The NRA has been pumping millions of dollars into influencing legislation and helping to elect those that align with its values. It began with providing funding to both political parties, but they have significantly switched to funding the Republican Party entirely. What is even more interesting is that instead of giving to incumbent Republicans, the NRA has now switched to spending completely against the Democratic Party, even with these candidates being pro-gun. I mention this point here because drawing clear lines on how money influences public policy is extremely difficult, but the fact that the NRA does spend money on one party versus another is important to note. I acknowledge the argument of money in special interest groups, but it does not influence my conclusion nor do I intend to address it any further. Who was the NRA? The original NRA was founded in 1871 by two Yankees, Colonel William C. Church and General George Wingate. That felt the Civil War dragged on longer than it needed to because of the Norse inability to shoot as well as their southern counterparts. The initial idea of the NRA came from British marksmanship programs. The founders felt that only private enterprise could promote and encourage rifle shooting on a scientific basis. The National Guard was just too slow to catch up with the growing need for better trained marksmen. This gave birth to new competition to rival Britain's Wimbledon Marksman Tournaments in 1873. This was the era of the sportsman. They enjoyed the sport of shooting, and it was said that marksman clubs began to outnumber golf clubs with the help and organization of the NRA. In February of 1903, Congress jumped on the marksmanship train, and an amendment to the War Department Appropriations Bill established the National Board for the Promotion of Rifle Practice, NBPRP. This government advisory board became the predecessor of today's Corporation for the Promotion of Rifle Practice and Firearm Safety, Incorporated, that now governs the CMP. The bill appropriated money to hold national tournaments and directly contributed to the NRA. In 1907, the national matches were moved to Camp Perry. The War Department spends about $500,000 a year to conduct these tournaments. In the past, surplus military gear was donated to the NRA outright. In fact, the Army still sells surplus ammunition to the Civilians Marksmanship Program, which is then sold to civilians. Beginning in the 1920s, the NRA began writing legislation for gun control. 
state gun control laws were the norm, and after Al Capone's St. Valentine's Day massacre in 1929, the NRA helped drafted the first federal gun control policies. The 1934 National Firearms Act and the 1938 Federal Firearms Act. Carl Frederick, the NRA president in 1934, during congressional NFA hearings testified, I have never believed in the general practice of carrying weapons. I seldom carry one. I do not believe in the general promiscuous toting of guns. I think it should be sharply restricted and only under license. On November 1963, after the assassination of President Kennedy, it was found that Oswald had ordered the weapon from an ad in the NRA's magazine. NRA Executive Vice President Franklin Orth supported a ban in mail order sales, saying, We do think that any sane American who calls himself an American can object to placing into this bill the instrument which killed the President of the United States. After the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., the public had strong fears about urban black nationalists having access to so many guns. On May 1967, two dozen Black Panther parties walked into the California State House carrying rifles to protest a gun control bill, prompting then-Governor Ronald Reagan to comment, There's no reason why on the street today a citizen should be carrying loaded weapons. This all led to the Gun Control Act of 1968 being reauthorized and deepened the FDR-era gun control laws. The NRA did successfully block a national registry of all guns, which some states had in colonial times, and mandatory licenses for all gun carriers. This may have been the start of the NRA's influence and change in becoming the political beast it is today. What about the economy? During this time, wealth inequality began to fall. The top 1% saw their wealth fall from 25% to about 10% under Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, and JFK. During the time under these presidents, the top marginal tax rate rose from around 60% to about 80%. Corporate tax rates also increased from 10% to about 45%. Capital gains tax rates fell. When we look at the top marginal tax rate, the highest income tax tier changed from $5 million to $200,000 in 1942 then to 400,000 in 1948 and back to 200,000 in 1965. These hikes in tax rates were due to the fact that many of the wealthy had figured out ways to reduce or dodge their tax liabilities. A higher marginal tax rate would lead to a liability that was equal to a lower tax rate after all exemptions were claimed by corporations. The bottom rate on regular income also rose about the same amount as the top did. Not only were the wealthy paying more, so was the bottom portion of society. Everyone contributed to their fair share of taxation. While the bottom percentage may have received more in the form of assistance from the government, they still paid a share of the increase in proportion to the top percent. This table here shows a very different type of tax. This tax generally targets the transfer of wealth instead of income. Before the 1970s, these taxes were substantial with very low exemptions. The maximum estate tax reached 77% in the years of the lowest wealth inequality. The maximum gift tax rate is also just as high during this time period. Exemptions for both taxes are also extremely low when compared to the rates of the last 10 years. Is it a mere coincidence that wealth inequality in America was at its lowest when the taxes below were at their highest? An NRA regime change in the era of Clifford Knox. Enter Clifford Neil Knox, a Texas-born gun journalist who helped create a new era of anti-gun legislation rhetoric. He believed that gun control laws were caused by malicious forces wanting to restrict American freedom. Knox began to feel that the NRA needed to change its mission and organized a grassroots movement to overthrow the current a NRA board using its own bylaws. In one night known as the Revolt at Cincinnati, the NRA shed itself of its old image and elected in a group of individuals that would offer a more expansive view of the Second Amendment and implicit distrust of any government firearm regulation. From this moment on, the NRA's new motto would be, 
The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. He also believed that much of the gun violence in the 1960s was a conspiracy. It is possible that some of those incidents could have been created for the purpose of disarming the people of the free will world. With drugs and evil intent, it's possible. Uh, rampant paranoia on my part, maybe, but there have been far too many coincidences to ignore. The NRA began to ramp up its congressional contributions while starting an entirely new propaganda campaign. They began publishing Second Amendment articles in their American Rifleman magazine with the intent to reinterpret American history and to find that the only regulation of guns should be an individual's inability to afford one. At the same time, they also be began promoting the gun industry through advertisements. The 1972 Republican platform openly endorsed gun control and, in less than eight years, changed to, we believe the right of citizens to keep and bear arms must be preserved. Accordingly, we oppose federal registration of firearms. It was here that the NRA gave their first ever presidential endorsement. In the early 1980s, the NRA released a brand new campaign called I Am The NRA. This campaign painted the diversity of NRA members from an 8-year-old BB gun shooter, Roy Rogers, former astronaut Wally Skira, to the Dallas to the former Dallas Cowboy cheerleader Joanne Hall. It was a huge success and allowed the NRA to become normalized as this American tradition, the right to keep and bear arms. One of the biggest changes in the NRA's rhetoric came with the help of a report called The Right to Keep and Bear Arms. This report was completed by the Subcommittee on the Constitution under the leadership of Utah Sen Senator Orrin G. Hatch. It was concluded that what they had uncovered was clear and long lost proof that the Second Amendment to our, our Constitution was intended as an individual right of the American citizen to keep and carry arms in a peaceful manner for protection of himself his family, and his freedoms. This evidence was found right after the Republicans gained control of the Senate for the first time in years, with the help of campaign contributions from the NRA's political arm, the Institute for Legislative Action. With the success of its I'm the NRA ad campaign and a public endorsement from former President Ronald Reagan, the NRA's membership had grown to 2.6 million, with a revenue of $66 million a year. They sponsored the mcclure volkmer amendments that revised many provisions of the Gun Control Act of 1968. The NRA fought against legislation trying to ban Teflon-coated ammunition or cop killer rounds and found themselves openly attacking police chiefs who were for gun control. The NRA ran political ads and sent direct mailers against these individuals to attack them as opponents. The NRA changes up and leaves Knox behind. Enter Warren Cassidy. Knox was fired without notice and replaced with Cassidy because they felt he was too hard on Congress. There have been lobbyists at the NRA whose, whose zeal has occasionally gotten in the way of their common sense, Cassidy stated. The NRA began to feel it could accomplish more if they were not so aggressive. Under this new philosophy, the Firearms Protection Act of 1986 was passed. It was considered a huge victory for the gun lobby, and especially the NRA. Many politicians said they only voted for it because of fear of the gun lobby's retaliation. However, the Second Amendment fundamentalists were furious with a late amendment that tightened restrictions on machine guns. This caused a decline in membership because many of the hardliners felt that the NRA had gone soft. Clifford Knox called out the NRA as too compromising and wimpy. Such rhetoric is, has been singing with the rise of the Tea Party and their uncompromising tactics against former President Obama. This all changed when the Brady Handgun Violence Protection Act was introduced. As a reaction to the attempted assassination of Reagan, it introduced a seven-day waiting period on gun purchases and a background check. The former NRA vice president replied appealing to the patriotic aspect of gun ownership. What if there had been a Brady Bill 150 years ago. What if they had to wait seven days to get the rifles to come to the Alamo and fight? This legislation pushed the NRA more to the right and increased its membership to a whole new level. 
Neil Knox returns. With the new members of Familiar Faces re-elected, Neil Knox. Compound this with their new vice president, Wayne LaPierre, a very smooth-talking lobbyist with a PhD in political science, and the old NRA of no compromise is rebirthed. LaPierre knew how to talk to the hardliners, and in 1993 said, Good, honest Americans stand divided, driven apart by a force that dwarfs any political power or social tyrant that ever existed before on this planet, the American media. Next came an assault weapons ban in 1994. This fired up the NRA's base and increased the power of their rhetoric. Militia groups began to grow that touted anti-government views fueled by the federal raids at Ruby Ridge, Idaho and the siege of agents in Waco, Texas. These incidents were spun to paint the government as the enemy of the people. After the 1994 midterm elections, the Democrats were voted out of the House in masses. But then came the bombing of a federal building by Timothy McVeigh in 1995. The NRA's anti-government rhetoric gained national attention, and a fundraising letter signed by LaPierre had been spotlighted. In the letter, it described that the new assault weapons ban as gives jackbooted government thugs more power to take away our constitutional rights, break in our doors, seize our guns, destroy our property, and even injure and kill us. It was at that time that former President George W. Bush denounced his NRA membership, and former NRA President Richard Riley stated, We were akin to the Boy Scouts of America, and now we're cast with the Nazis, the skinheads, and the Ku Klux Klan. By 2000, the NRA had become closely aligned with the Republican Party and fought to keep Al Gore from becoming president. It was in May 2000 that one of the most popular NRA, NRA slogans was coined. So, as uh, we set out this year to defeat the divisive forces that would take freedom away, I want to say those fighting words for everyone within the sound of my voice to hear and to heed, and especially for you, Mr. Gore. <laughs> From my cold, dead hands. The increase of wealth inequality. Sometime in the mid-1970s, the 95th percentile began pulling away from the rest of the other classes. While income and wealth are not the same, income can influence wealth generation. There are three major reasons for this increase. The war on drugs slash crime, the disappearing middle class, and changes in public policy. The war on drugs and the prison population. In the 1970s, the nation was given a new perspective about the drug epidemic. Nixon began this rhetoric by criminalizing drug addiction. Nixon viewed drug abuse as law-breaking hedonists who deserved only discipline and punishment. Instead of focusing on the factors that led to crime, Nixon focused national attention on the criminal. He was able to not only exonerate white middle class families from the drug related violence in inner cities, but also painted the public image of the drug user into one of the most dangerous and anarchic threat to American civilization. This is when we had a nation this is when we as a nation began to view incarceration for the nation's own good. With the focus on locking people up, the prison population began to rise at about the same time wealth inequality began to rise. One possible reason for this is that the more people locked up, the less people for tax revenue and an increase in tax spending. The burden begins to shift to other classes. At a time in which Republic Republicans are beginning to rise in power and influence, the wealthy were shifting their tax burdens downwards to the middle class. With more and more lower class people in prison, who is left to fund the national budget? Step in Republican ideologies that want you to reduce the tax burden on the American people. As more and more Americans are incarcerated through public policy, a problem is created and a simple answer is reduce taxation for the working class. Lower taxation without cutting government program leads to bigger deficits. What is the solution? Of course, small government, a starve the beast tactic meant to reduce taxation for Republicans, but also accomplish the smaller government of libertarian philosophy. Both parties win by creating a problem through their party's philosophy and introducing policy to correct the problems that they originally created. The champions of this logic are put into power through the help of the NRA. 
The NRA dilutes the conversation by focusing only on the Second Amendment rights and the fight for freedom and liberty. Its consumer base then votes for these principles while unknowingly voting for policies that increase wealth inequality. So how does increased incarceration lead to increased wealth inequality? One major factor is that when these individuals leave prisons, they have negative stereotypes attached to them. When they apply for jobs, a criminal record is a stain on their resume and has been shown to influence their ability to even get an interview or call back. Deval Pager's experimental research has studied these employer perceptions by sending pairs of fake job seekers to apply for real jobs. In each pair, one of the job applicants was randomly assigned a resume indicating a criminal record. A parole officer is listed as a reference, and the criminal applicant was instructed to check the box on the job application indicating he had a criminal record. A criminal record was found to reduce callbacks from prospective employers by around 50%, an effect that was larger for African Americans than for whites. If people who get out of prisons cannot find gainful employment, then how can they generate an income that will lead to wealth acquisition? Secondly, conditions of imprisonment actually promote behaviors and habits that are counter to the routine of regular work. Time in prison reduces work experience and skills obtained before imprisonment are diminished. The, in the increased rhetoric of being tough on crime has undoubtedly led to an increase in wealth inequality. Our focus on treating criminals with punishment rather than rehabilitation has limited those convicted to their same social class and the generations that follow them. This problem was created by our reaction to the increase of crime during the 1980s and our failure to understand the complexities of what causes crime and what crime is. The Middle Class Since 1970, the middle class has been shrinking while the upper class has been growing. But who made up this middle class? Around this time period, the middle class was mostly white, uneducated adults. Looking at this chart would explain why education was not as important. See, manufacturing jobs were high paying and needed little in education. However, when we look at today, the middle class is dominated by those who have at least an associate degree or higher. As the job market demands a more highly skilled workforce, education begins to uh, begins to become a divisive factor of staying in the middle class. The middle class has been losing ground, while the bottom and top classes have gained enough to equal the middle class in numbers. Aggregate income has fallen for the middle class, risen for the upper class, and stayed stagnant for the lower class. Median income for all classes has risen all the way until about 2000. Since then, all classes have decreased. Public Policy during the 1960s, the Democratic Party began to shift its political capital from redistributive policies to that of race and sex equality. This term made many Southern voters uncomfortable because inequality was now being tied to race. According to Howard Rosenthal, in his paper Politics, Public Policy, and Inequality, A Look Back at the 20th Century, he said, in other words, the enfranchisement of African Americans in the South shifted the policy debate from one of north-south or urban rural redistribution among whites to one of black, white, black, or rich, poor redistribution. Also, with the passing of the Immigration Act of 1965, Rosenthal continues, This immigration may well have exposed the domestic poor to wage competition, and moreover, caused the lower income brackets to become less represented in the voting population. The minimum wage. With the end of the Democratic majority in the election of Nixon, the minimum wage has been stagnant. Minimum wage has been a measure to help control wealth inequality and has remained at a 1950 level even with small increases after Nixon. Inflation has destroyed most of the real wage gains over the last few decades. These policies closely reflect which party is in power. Most of the increase in wage policies have been enacted under Democratic leadership, but inequality also fell before there ever was a federal minimum wage, and we should not paint it as the only factor that keeps wealth inequality in check. Estate and Corporate Tax Rates Another huge policy tactic that has been the estate and corporate tax rates. When we look at the estate tax, party polarization is more evidence, evident here than the minimum wage. 
As Republicans begin to take more and more power, the estate tax has decreased, and the exemption amount has increased by 12% since 2001. There's a similar trend with the corporate tax rate. As the tax rate goes down, the top tax bracket for corporations increases. In the last 50 years, it has increased 366%. Corporate profits before taxes have risen about $20 billion, but the taxes paid on that income has decreased by about the same amount. CEO Compensation According to Jacob S. Hacker and Paul Pearson in Winner Take All Politics, CEO compensation has risen at a staggering rate. With the decline of the power of unions, CEO compensation has risen 997.2% since the 1980s, while typical worker pay has risen a mere 10%. With corporate profits at an all-time high, then how is it only the very top has seen any real increase in compensation? Could it be companies are just not that productive? Well, according to this chart, it just isn't true. Somewhere around 1970, hourly compensation began to increase at a rate much lower than protect productivity. So workers are being more productive, yet not earning anything more. This doesn't give justice to the claim of work hard and bear the fruits of your labor. It seems that productivity was absorbed by the top management with, with insanely high price compensation packages. If there's one thing to learn, it's that CEOs and the bottom workers' performance do not correlate to their compensation. Pearson and Hacker point this out by mentioning the Home Depot CEO Bob Nardelli. He was awarded a $210 million compensation package after being fired while the company's stock tanked under his leadership. Family Wealth When we look beyond individual wealth, we see that family wealth ropes rose substantially pre-1983 from the 50th percentile making $39,741 to an $80,150, a 102% increase in 20 years. The top 99 percentile went from $1,411,488 to $3,218,818, a 120% 8% increase. But when we fast forward another 20 years, things start to look bad for the lower and middle class. The 50th percentile went from 80,150 to a mere 81,400, a whopping 1.5%, while the 99th percentile went from $3,218,818 to $7,880,000. And $400, a 144% increase. Minority families are hit even harder when it comes to wealth inequality. Whites have increased their wealth by seven times in 20 years over African Americans and Hispanics. The change of the Republican platform. Let's now look at how the Republican platform has changed since 1970 while keeping in mind the increasing wealth inequality happening in the background. I will focus on anything Second Amendment related to show the correlation of the changing rhetoric of the NRA and the increasing attention of crime as a national concern and how both of these issues correlate to the change of the Republican Party platform. 1960. The word gun, weapon, or Second Amendment is never mentioned in the entire platform. Not one word in this platform has anything to do with the citizen and their right to own a weapon. 1972. Intensify efforts to prevent criminal access to all weapons, including special emphasis on cheap, readily, readily obtainable handguns, retaining primary responsibility at the state level, with such federal law as necessary to enable the states to meet those responsibilities. Safeguard the right of responsible citizens to collect, own, and use firearms for legitimate purposes, including hunting, target shooting, and self-defense. We will strongly support efforts of all law enforcement agencies to apprehend and prosecute to the limit of the law all those who use firearms in the commission of crimes. 1980. We believe the right of citizens to keep and bear arms must be preserved. Accordingly, we oppose federal registrations of firearms. Mandatory sentences for commission of armed felonies are the most effective means to deter abuse of this right. 
We therefore support congressional initiatives to remove those provisions of the Gun Control Act of 1968 that do not significantly impact armed crime but serve rather to restrain the law abiding citizen in his legitimate use of firearms. 1992. Republicans defend the constitutional right to keep and bear arms. We call for stiff mandatory sentences for those who use firearms in a crime. We know that those who seek to disarm citizens in their homes are the small liberals who tried to disarm our nation during the Cold War and are today seeking to cut our national defense below safe levels. We applaud congressional Republicans for overturning the District of Columbia's law blaming firearm manufacturers for street crime. 2000. Help states ensure school safety by letting children in dangerous schools transfer to schools that are safe for learning and by forcefully protect per prosecuting youth who carry or use guns and the adults who provide them. We defend the constitutional right to keep and bear arms and we affirm the individual responsibility to safely use and store firearms. Because self-defense is a basic human right, we will promote training in their use, safe usage, especially in federal programs where for women and the elderly. A Republican administration will vigorously enforce current gun laws neglected by the Democrats, especially by prosecuting dangerous offenders identified as felons in instant background checks. Although we support background checks to ensure that guns do not fall in the hands of criminals, we oppose federal licensing of law-abiding gun owners and national gun registration as a violation of the Second Amendment and an invasion of privacy of honest citizens. Through programs like Project Exile, we will hold criminals individually accountable for their actions. By strong enforcement of federal and state firearm laws, especially when guns are used in violent or drug-related crimes. Any juvenile who commits any crime while carrying a gun should automatically be detained, not released to somebody's custody. 2012. We uphold the right of individuals to keep and bear arms, a right which antedated the Constitution and was solemnly confirmed by the Second Amendment. We acknowledge, support, and defend the law-abiding citizens' God-given right to self-defense. We call for the protection of such fundamental individual rights recognized in the Supreme Court's decision in District of Columbia v. Heller and McDonald v. Chicago affirming that right, and we recognize the individual responsibility to safely use and store firearms. This also includes the right to obtain and store ammunition without registration. We support the fundamental right to self-defense wherever a law-abiding citizen has a legal right to be. And we support federal legislation that would expand the exercise of that right by allowing those with state-issued carry permits to carry firearms in any state that issues such permits to its own residents. Gun ownership is responsible citizenship, enabling Americans to defend their homes and communities. We condemn frivolous lawsuits against gun manufacturers and oppose federal licensing or registration of law-abiding gun owners. We oppose legislation that is intended to restrict our Second Amendment rights by limiting the capacity of clips or magazines or otherwise restoring the ill-considered Clinton gun ban. We condemn the reckless actions associated with the operation known as Fast and Furious, conducted by the Department of Justice, which resulted in the murder of a U.S. Border Patrol agent and others on both sides of the border. We applaud the members of the U.S. House of Representatives in holding the current administration's Attorney General in contempt of Congress for his refusal to cooperate with the investigation into that debacle. We oppose the improper collection of firearm sales information in the four southern border states, which was imposed without congressional authority. As we go through the Republican Party's platform over the last 30 years, the mention of anything related to weapons and citizens was non-existent. It wasn't until 1972 that we begin to see the Second Amendment or the right to bear arms being mentioned. The word weapon or arms was only in reference to national defense prior to 1972. We also see the rhetoric of criminal prosecution begin to unfold. In 1980, we begin to see the objection to firearm registries and many elements of the Firearm Control Act of 1969 and mandatory sentences. In 1992, they specifically call out liberals, and in 2000, they blame Democrats for not enforcing gun laws. 
It is here we begin to see some of the same rhetoric the NRA has been using. In 2012, the basic human right is transformed into a God-given right of self-defense. Conclusion By painting a vivid picture of the NRA in its original beginnings, I've shown how the NRA has changed drastically over time into its current form. From the sportsmen to the patriotic defenders of liberty, the NRA's rhetoric has changed dramatically. Most of these changes fall solely on the takeover of a strong libertarian element in 1972. As the NRA gained strength in membership, it also began flexing its muscles through the legislative system. The NRA's clever marketing has pushed a more extreme libertarian ideology to become the new norm of the Republican Party. In, the chart, in this chart, we see that the Republican Party began to polarize beginning in the 1970s. Democrats have moved considerably slower from the center when compared to their Republican counterparts. I would also say that this movement was heavily influenced by the rhetoric of the NRA. As the NRA began funding to put more Republicans into control, these Republicans also became more libertarian in thinking. Over time, the NRA only funded Republican opponents, and when Republicans took most of the seats, it switched its tactics to spending money against Democratic opponents. Incumbents are hard to unseat, so they already have a huge advantage. These new Republicans also favored many of the policies that have led to the increase of wealth inequality. The Libertarian platform says this about taxation. The Libertarian Party is fundamentally opposed to the use of force to coerce people into doing anything. We think it's inherently wrong and should have no role in a civilized society. Thus, we think that the government forcing people to pay taxes is inherently wrong. So any legislation that cut taxes would undoubtedly be the end goal of a Libertarian. Through example of real NRA examples, advertisements, I have traced the change in the promotion of gun safety and sporting to the anti-government libertarian rhetoric they use now. I've also shown the evolution of the Republican Party platform since 1960. It wasn't until 1972 that the Republican Party's platform included anything about guns, which happens to occur after the change in the NRA's ideology. By contrasting the NRA and wealth inequality pre and after 1960s, I've shown how these elements have changed on a similar trajectory of each other. While it would be impossible to point the finger towards one thing, the one thing that undoubtedly has caused the rise of wealth inequality, the NRA's rhetoric and wide-reaching network has a strong correlation to the rise in wealth inequality. The NRA has sold America its love for guns while slowly putting them on the path towards a society in which wealth inequality is personal freedom. Uh, hopefully you guys like this video. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, leave a comment below if you have any questions or whatever. Uh, let's talk about it. Thanks guys.